So hi everyone, uh, welcome to our, our spectral indices for land and aquatic applications training. This is part two, so we're going to concentrate today on aquatic applications. And uh, as always, my name is Juan Torres Perez, and I am joined today by Amber McCollum, and Brittany Baudry, and also Sativa Cruz. Uh, um, all of us are with uh, the NASA Ames Research Center in California. Now, here's a, just a little bit about the purpose of this training, uh, and it's uh, concentrating on providing an overview of some of the commonly used uh, spectral indices for both aquatic and land applications. And uh, our participants will see some examples of uh, spectral index calculations with uh, diverse sensors, including even Landsat 9 and Sentinel 2, and also with the harmonized Landsat Sentinel uh, data sets. And, and uh, we will also show some demos, short demos on uh, using Google Earth Engine for both aquatic and land applications. Now, here's some of the general objectives for the for this training as a whole. Uh, is uh, obviously to recognize some of the commonly used uh, spectral indices for land and aquatic uh, environments. Also, to distinguish between uh, the spectral indices and then uh, to be able to select uh, the best ones that are suited for any given uh, land or aquatic system uh, application or interest of interest, and uh, also to learn a little bit uh, how to compute uh, spectral index uh, calculations and over some of some of your areas of interest, and how to acquire some of the products uh, that are available already available for for high, uh, for spectral indices uh, for a variety of sources. Again, remember that this is an introductory webinar, so we have a prerequisite of the fundamentals of remote sensing, which is uh, you can find on the RSET uh, webpage, or if you have the unequivalent experience, that that also counts. Now, again, this is part two. Last week we had part one, on a, which was an overview of spectral indices. Today we're concentrating on aquatic applications, and we we have uh, two different times at uh, 11 to 12 uh, or also uh, 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, also remember that we will have one homework that will open on the last day, so next week, uh, November 9th. And it's uh, due two weeks uh, after. The deadline is two weeks after, so uh, weeks after November 23rd. And uh, you can fill the homework and then submit the homework. And then if you attended all three parts and completed the homework, you will eventually receive a certificate of completion that uh, will be sent to you. Uh, obviously, as you know, our set webinars, in our set webinars, we have a lot of participants. So it will probably take at least a couple of months to get those certificates, but eventually you will get them. This is us, uh, Brittany Baudry, who's uh, one of our trainers, uh, Amber. She's our team lead for the ecological conservation team, ARSA team, myself, Juan, and also Sativa Cruz. Uh, she's one of our newest instructors or trainers for our eco, eco conservation uh, team. Okay, so specifically for part two, uh, today, uh, the participants will be able to recognize some of the common uh, indices for, uh, particularly for aquatic applications, and to distinguish some of the basic differences between those indices uh, developed for aquatic systems, and also how to uh, some differences between the indices that are developed for aquatic systems versus the ones that are developed for land applications. Uh, also to recognize some of the main regions of the electromagnetic spectrum that are particularly useful for aquatic applications, and to uh, review some of the recent examples of the use of the, some of these indices uh, for coastal and, and ocean applications. And as I said, we will have a short demo on the use of Google Earth Engine for calculating some of these indices as well. This is a, a very broad uh, review of what we covered during the first uh, part last week. 
as, as we mentioned, every surface on Earth reflects and absorbs energy in different ways. Plants, for example, absorb in the blue and the red region of the spectrum, and that's why they usually reflect in the green. That's why we see the, the leaves green and in the near infrared uh, region of the spectrum. So different surfaces have different spectral signatures. And, uh, and the spectral indices are very simple, usually very simple band ratios that will highlight a specific process or property or either on the land or on aquatic uh, surface. So uh, for instance, last week we covered a little bit about the one of the most common commonly used uh, indices for land applications, the normalized difference vegetation index index or NDVI. And NDVI is particularly useful to follow uh, phenology in plants, such as in the in the graphs that you're seeing here in the in the bottom of the of the slide. And uh, in the case of NDVI uh, specifically, it's a simple relationship that uses the red and the near infrared regions of the of the spectrum. NDVI is also very useful for analyzing uh, vegetation vegetation health as well. Now, as a reminder, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but during this whole webinar, you feel free to put your questions, write down your questions in the question box. And uh, during the Q&A, we will address those questions. Probably because of the limitations in time, we will not have enough time to go over all the questions that are submitted by all the participants. But uh, make, be sure that we will address those questions. We will answer them in the in the Q&A document, and the Q&A document will be available in the on the training webpage uh, within the next days or so for all, all, all of our participants. So if we can't answer your question because of the limitations on time, don't worry, we will answer it in the in the Q&A document. Okay, so let's then examine some of the most common uh, spectral indices for aquatic applications. And uh, again, keep in mind that because of time constraints, we will not go into too much in depth on um, some of these uh, spectral indices also because it's, uh, it is an, it is an introductory uh, webinar, but uh, we will nonetheless provide some valuable re uh, references for those of you who are interested in, let's say, in the what's what was the arithmetic uh, development of these uh, indices, or uh, even uh, references on other projects that have applied these or similar indices also. For, for aquatic applications, either on land, in, inland water bodies, or in coastal areas. Okay, so before we go into the details on some of the spectral indices, it's always uh, good to review the, uh, some of the properties of the uh, uh, optical properties of water and how water quality affects those uh, optical properties. So uh, different wavelengths penetrate differently in the water column, and this will influence the amount of information that the sensors obtain. So for example, wavelengths in the blue region are usually, so what we're seeing here, are usually the ones that uh, penetrate deeper into the water column. And obviously this is why we see the uh, ocean, particularly in the uh, open waters, uh, blue or dark dark blue uh, colored, whereas those wavelength longer wavelengths are like the reds uh, or even the near infrareds they penetrate penetrate much less in the water column. So the signal received by the sensor either in orbit or airborne is not only affected by the penetration of light in the water column but also is affected by the components of the atmosphere. Um, and for example, some of the light uh, is scattered by some of the particles in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, it can also be absorbed by some of the particles, and this will eventually affect the signal that is received by the sensor, and eventually the the, the quality of the image that you will uh, be able to get. Now. Uh, let's keep in mind that when we talk about ocean color in this webinar, we are for most times uh, referring to what is known as the remote sensing reflectance. And the remote sensing reflectance is a function 
of the inherent optical properties of the materials in the water. So, for example, absorption by phytoplankton, by non-algal particles, by color dissolved organic matter or CDOM, um, by the water itself, and also uh, scattering in the in the backward or forward direction by particles and other materials that are suspended in the water column. Uh, it also contains a correction, correction factor denoted here by the letter C to relate what's known as the subsurface uh, uh, irradiance reflectance to what we know as radiance reflectance. Now, the remote sensing reflectance is the water leaving radiance corrected for bidirectional effects of the air sea interface and also the the subsurface uh, light field, so the, the light field in the water column, and normalized by the downwelling solar irradiance denoted here by ED, uh, which is uh, the irradiance just above the, the sea surface. Now, the remote sensing reflectance is the fundamental remote sensing quantity for which most, most ocean color products are the, the, the rivet. For example, uh, chlorophyll, uh, products for chlorophyll, particulate uh, inorganic carbon, light absorption by different components, uh, suspended sediments, among others. Now, take a moment to look at the diversity of colors in this uh, scene that we have here on the right hand side. Now, the inherent optical properties of the material in the water give the water its characteristic color. So, inversely, uh, it is possible to use the color of the water to see uh, we, that we see from uh, from the imager, and in and infer what are the inherent optical properties of the water to then address some of the some questions like, for example, what's the Chlorophyll concentration, what is the clarity of the water or the turbidity of the water, um, how much sediments are suspended in the in the water column. And these are the types of questions that we can relate to some of the spectral indices that we will see uh, today. Now, I would like you to take a look uh, uh, for a moment at the plot on the right here. And the remote sensing reflectance that you see here uh, correspond to some of those examples that we saw uh, in the previous slide. For instance, chlorophyll, water, uh, non algal particles or sediments or CDOM uh, here. And uh, these are uh, schematic illustrations of the remote sensing reflectance spectra. So these are not actual uh, spectra, but the purpose of this is to show you where some of these components actually reflect uh, within the visible and also in the near infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, for instance, sediments typically reflect uh, within the yellowish to the red, and then they also have a peak in the near infrared. This is the the, the reason what we see when the water is uh, is very murky. We see it as uh, maybe brownish or grayish grayish uh, color. Uh, in the case of water, water. Uh, as I said, absorbs uh, greatly uh, in the reds and also near infrared. So that is, that's why it's, it mostly uh, reflects in the on the blue region of the spectrum. And uh, CDOM uh, also reflects around the green to uh, to yellows. It's actually some some people call CDOM yellow substance. And uh, chlorophylls, as we know, they reflect within the within the green region of the spectrum. Now, in addition to suspended sediments and cold dissolved organic matter, or CDOM, what are some of the other water quality indicators that satellite can observe from our vehicle can be used to, uh, or can be even de uh, derived? Uh, B, some of these include uh, sea surface temperature. Uh, uh, we mentioned chlorophyll, uh, of course, uh, salinity, uh, the diffuse attenuation of light, uh, what's called the KD for a KD, uh, the vertical attenuation coefficient, or in the, uh, there's some, some other products that are in particular wavelengths, such as the take as the KD 490. Uh, so vertical attenuation coefficient at 490 nanometers, and uh, also the uh, euphoric depth, 
which is uh, uh, where the light attenuates to about 1% of the amount that we, the, we found in the, the water surface. Now, unlike uh, land surfaces, water itself, as I mentioned, absorbs uh, strongly in the red. This is what, what we're seeing here in the, in the blue in this graph. Also in the near infrared and the shortwave infrared regions of the spectrum. So even in highly uh, turbid waters, uh, as in the case of what we call in oceanography uh, case two, coastal waters, water is opaque or black in the uh, shortwave infrared uh, region. And this can be used as, as an advantage when analyzing coastal regions as uh, these wavelengths then can be used for some atmospheric corrections. Other water constituents like uh, CDOM, like I said, absorb greatly uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the blue uh, region of the spectrum. And, uh, and also, um, uh, because of chlorophyll and other photosynthetic pigments absorbed strongly in the blue and the red regions, they, have a, they also have a, a, a higher reflectance in the green and also in the uh, near infrared. So pixels containing floating algae, for instance, can be different for, from, uh, let's say, water pixels. And this is the essence for using some of the spectral indices that we will see today. Like, for instance, the floating, aqua, uh, floating algae index, or FAI, to monitor the presence or absence of floating algae, such as sargassum or kelps, uh, also in coastal waters. But since most of these indices that we will mention today are dedicated to photosynthetic tile targets or chlorophyll, uh, let's uh, first touch briefly on one index that was developed to assess the turbidity in inland and in coastal uh, water bodies. And this is what we refer to as the Normalized Difference Turbidity Index, or NDTI, which was originally developed by Lacoste et al. In, in 2007 for water quality assessment, uh, in this case in ponds and small inland water bodies, um, because they were, they were their focus, uh, uh, the study areas were small inland water bodies. They used the uh, spot five uh, level two images. So these are uh, 10 meter special resolution images. Um, but uh, NDTI, there's been some uh, other attempts of, of, of applying NDTI uh, to other uh, type of images, such as those from Landsat or Sentinel uh, as well. And uh, here is uh, the figure on the right here is uh, from one of our most recent NASA Ames uh, developed program projects that uh, in this uh, particular case aim to study the impacts of water quality on the distribution of eelgrass in the South Slough National Estuary Research uh, reserve in Oregon. Uh, here, it was assumed that uh, most of the turbidity in the slough was caused either by sedimentation or by organic debris. And uh, what we see here is uh, how with, uh, how the turbidity in particular um, uh, was uh, different uh, as we move throughout the uh, throughout the years, how it changes through changed throughout the, the year, and eventually. Uh, they studied on how this uh, impacted the the uh, presence or absence of uh, eelgrass in this uh, South Slough in Oregon. Uh, here's the the uh, the calculation as you see for NDTI, relatively simple. Uh, the red band uh, minus the green uh, divided by the red plus the green, and then it will give you an index of uh, turbidity. And like I said, here's the uh, the reference for, for that particular paper. Now, as mentioned on these and other previous uh, RCET webinars, chlorophyll is, is an indicator of phytoplankton uh, biomass, as it's usually the main uh, pigment in, in most of these uh, uh, communities. Uh, it can also be used uh, indirectly to estimate nutrients in the water column, as uh, typically, you know, waters with high chlorophyll concentration are eutrophic, or they have uh, their they have a high concentration of nutrients, uh, usually, uh, especially nitrates or or phosphates. 
Now, one of the main uh, indices for for uh, chlorophyll or algae that we will mention is uh, also one of the most uh, commonly used is a normalized difference chlorophyll index or NDCI. NDCI was proposed by Mishra and Mishra in 2012 uh, to predict concentrations in this case in turbid waters and uh, using the MERIS uh, data sets. Now, the overarching objective of the Mishra and Mishra paper was to improve the accuracy of uh, chlorophyll A retrieval in turbid uh, productive waters using a simple, easy to, easy to implement uh, and intuitive, kind of similar to NDVI for the vegetation and land uh, uh, systems, and an universal model. So the concept of NDCI was developed using uh, simulated data. However, field data sets were acquired for uh, the same geographic regions uh, and were used to further validate the data uh, all the, the results from NDCI. Now, NDCI, as you see here in the uh, in the slide, it uses the remote sensing reflectance at uh, two different wavelengths, uh, 708 and 665 uh, nanometers. So this uh, emulates the uh, the Meris uh, channels. And uh, similar to other turbid uh, productive uh, chlorophyll A algorithms, the index uses the information from, uh, like I said, from the reflectance that is around the 700 and uh, peak, which is uh, maximally sensitive to the variations in chlorophyll in the water. And uh, it also uses the information around 665 which is uh, uh, also generally as assigned to uh, the absorption of uh, by by chlorophyll. Now, um, they selected these two uh, different uh, band sets uh, here to uh, to develop NDCI and to avoid uh, some of the confounding influence that can be brought if you use different uh, wavelengths, or let's say the bluish wavelengths. Uh, from the uh, presence of CDOM or total suspended sediments in the on the on the water reflectance spectra. Um, also, since both both bands are relatively close to each other, uh, they also assume that the CDOM and uh, so total suspended solids absorption was uh, similar in magnitude as well. Now, based on the results of this uh, study, um, the, uh, the 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 combined range of CDOM and and, and TSS uh, absorptions at uh, 665 and and, uh, and 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 708 uh, were uh, approximately equal, and they assume that uh, it could be negligible. Now, following this uh, the simplistic model of NDVI, then NDCI. Um, it's, uh, it can be used to have an idea of what is the concentration of chlorophyll in the at the water surface, and also to kind of try to predict the presence or absence of uh, of uh, photosynthetic organisms in the water column. And again, here is the reference for the Mishra and Mishra paper. Okay, this, uh, uh, like I say, NDCI uh, uh, values can be also indicative of regions that are impacted by nutrients um, because what it measures is the presence of chlorophyll and chlorophyll is influenced by the amount of nutrients in the water column. So in general, uh, NDCI, as I said uh, previously, will give you an idea of the concentration of phytoplankton, but in relatively clear and shallow water, something to, to, to take into account is that this type of index can be influenced by the presence of benthic vegetation, such as, such as seagrass or, or green algae, or in this case, uh, uh, eelgrass. Here is the uh, some of the results from the same NASA developed project that I mentioned previously on the South Slough where we see that through time how uh, the how chlorophyll behaved uh, in the slough. And, but like I said, this, this is a particularly shallow area. 
So some of these results might or might not be influenced by also the presence of, uh, of eelgrass in this case. These are areas that are, uh, some of these areas were, uh, you know, centimeters or, or, or about a meter or less in depth. Now, as, as we have seen in, in previous trainings, um, in the case of kelps in particular, the blades can float in the water surface due to the presence of uh, gas filled structures. And as kelp blades occur at or near the surface of the water, indices usually developed for land purposes, such as, such as NDVI, can potentially be applied to study the kelps uh, to estimate the health of these uh, magnificent organisms, especially in the, the, the ones that are you know, floating. Now, the graph on the right here shows data from, uh, from a paper from uh, Schroeder et al. Where, uh, where you can see a marked difference in the reflectance um, of an un unsubmerged uh, kelp. So for instance, here's a, the one that it's uh, floating in the water column. You see the high reflectance in the near infrared versus the uh, kelps that it's uh, submerged. Let's say the this one, this graph uh, on the like, yellowish where you see that the reflectance in the near infrared is, uh, is very small. Now, notice that even in the first centimeters of water, there's practically no signal on the near infrared in this, uh, some of these uh, uh, graphs here. Now, another index, uh, such as the floating alga, algae index developed by Xiaoming Hu, and, and it's uh, was published in Remote Sensing of the Environment, um, uh, was, can also be applied to this type of uh, situations. Um, but we will show in a moment uh, some details about the floating algae index. And it can also, be, in this case, can also be used to map uh, uh, floating kelps in the, in the water surface. Now, the FAI uh, uses the red region of the spectrum and the short wave infrared, as we will see. And FAI was specifically uh, developed for MODIS data. But before we go into the FAI, we can mention here also that uh, here, for instance, in, the, in this graph on the right hand, uh, we are showing how the percentage, and this, this is data from Kyle Cavana from the UCLA. Uh, we're showing how the percentage of uh, floating kelps in this case can influence the signal received by the sensor in the near infrared region. So not only whether it's submerged or not, or not, but also the percentage of the of floating algae within a particular pixel. So therefore, the spatial resolution of the sensor is another is, uh, important aspect to consider when using uh, spectral indices to characterize floating vegetation uh, in a particular region. Most most times or also, sometimes as the budget allows, uh, these type of studies are also have a field component where the percent cover is characterized uh, in situ to, to then to help understand the values that are obtained with the remotely sensed data and also the values that are obtained with us and with these indices. Here's a similar data set, in this case, showing uh, how the signal changes as a floating algae, in this case, sargassum in the Caribbean or in the Atlantic uh, are either completely exposed or slightly submerged. And how, uh, as you see here in the left-hand uh, graph here, how it's, uh, this reflects on the, on the near infrared region of the spectrum here. You see the, 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 the big difference here, the significant difference here between the reflection. Uh, of the uh, within the near infrared um, in the in those uh, mass of sargassum that are uh, the ones that are uh, emerged, so they are at the water surface versus those that are just below the water surface, such as uh, the the photo that we're seeing here on the right hand side. Now. Some of the sensors that have been used uh, for sargassum in particular are uh, the uh, Modis Aqua, Modis Terra, and Beers. 
And uh, as a reminder, um, they provide images with a cross track of about 2,330 kilometers and a special resolution of, kilo, of uh, one kilometer, 500 or 250 kilometers, depending on the spectral bands for MODIS, and a, and a SWAT width of about 3,000 kilometers and a spatial resolution of 750 and 315 uh, uh, meters, depending on the spectral bands for beers. Now, MODIS and beers, they, the, the advantage is that they ensure quasi-global coverage of the Earth each day. And two of the algal indices that we will mention in a moment, the floating algal index and the alternative floating algal index were uh, developed with, uh, particularly with MODIS data. FAI uses MODIS high resolution spectral bands um, and the 250 meters, but it's very sensitive to clouds, uh, making it difficult to differentiate sargassum from clouds and other artifacts. Now the AFAI, which is based on the one kilometer uh, ocean color spectral bands, is uh, computed from the Rayleigh uh, corrected reflectance using the CDAS that we have covered in other uh, in other webinars, and that it's uh, it's already available from NASA. Now let's talk a bit about both uh, indices. Let's start with the floating algae uh, index. Here's the the equation for the for the FAI. Note that it uses the reflectance in the red, the near infrared, and also in the uh, shortwave infrared region uh, of the spectrum. And it's kind of similar to other indices or methods used for chlorophyll, such as um, you may be familiarized with um, what is known as the fluorescent line height or FLL, FLH, uh, proposed by uh, Letelier and Abbott in, in 1996. Um, or the MERIS maximum chlorophyll index uh, proposed by, by Gower et al. In, in 2005. We don't, will not cover those uh, here today because of uh, the, the uh, lack of time. But uh, the FAI uh, basically uses a, a different combination of bands. Now, also note that for FAI, uh, Chan Ming Hu, who was a researcher that a colleague that developed this uh, this ind index uh, recommends using the 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 twelve hundred and forty nanometer uh, sphere band of MODIS instead of the uh, sixteen hundred and forty or twenty one hundred and thirty nanometer bands. Now, for clear atmospheres, the reason is that for clear atmospheres, the twelve hundred and forty band leads to a lower baseline and a higher FAI values, uh, which are closer to the truth, um, true values. Also, uh, the 1640 and 2130 nanometer bands have lower sensitives, therefore they have a, they have a higher no noise. Nonetheless, um, in the absence of a 1240 nanometer band, uh, he also recommends as an alternative using the, the 1640 nanometer band. Uh, for the for the sewer region. Now here's an example of the application of the FAI to detect sargassum with, with MODIS aqua data in this case. We can see clearly how the sargassum mats are shown in the image of the of the left here and how even with this uh, multi-spectral data set we can see the big difference in the remote sensing reflectance especially uh, in the near infrared uh, region of the spectrum here. Now, Hugh also compared uh, the FAI uh, efficiency for detecting uh, floating algae to other land-based algorithms, such as the uh, NDVI and also the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EBI. And uh, what uh, what uh, what Chumming, uh found was that uh, in this case FAI values appear to be more stable, meaning that the uh, the standard deviation was uh, smaller uh, than those of NDVI and EVI uh, over algae and also over water pixels. 
Now, here's data provided by some of our colleagues from the University of Puerto Rico, the Bioptical Oceanography Lab, where they apply the FAI to detect sargassum mats in the in southwest Puerto Rico at a much higher spatial resolution, you see, you, in this case, using Sentinel data at 10 meter uh, uh, pixel size. They applied a land mask, which is uh, what you're seeing here in, in, uh, in, in, in black. And the zoom image on the on the right here shows a chronic accumulation of sargassum close or uh, to the shoreline here. Now the UPR colleagues, uh, in particular doctors uh, Roy Armstrong and William Hernandez, uh, they're using FAI in combination with a uh, time lapse uh, photography to monitor the accumulation of sargassum floating mats each year and how this impacts the marine life at the La Palguera Natural. Uh, reserve in southwest Puerto Rico. Now, one difficulty of the FAI is that there is not effective uh, cloud masking method. There, it doesn't have an effective cloud masking method, and therefore, usually sargassum slicks and clouds are represented by high uh, FAI values. Now, to overcome this difficulty, uh, the uh, alternate floating algae index or AFAI was developed by Juan and Chaming Hu in, in 2016. And the AFAI includes uh, uh, cloud masking through different band, band combinations. Here, three spectral bands, the, the, uh, the red, 607, uh, 67 nanometers, near infrared, and 748 nanometers, and the SWIR. Uh, in this case, at uh, 869 nanometers were used. And, but also note that although 869 nanometers is within the near infrared spectral range, for simplicity and consistency, this is still termed uh, uh, SWIR or, or shortwave infrared by the authors. Now, another important aspect is that while the AFAI has a lower spatial resolution, it was meant for one kilometer pixels, uh, compared to the 250 pixels of FAI. Um, the one kilometer bands uh, used for FAI has a, has a much higher signal to noise ratios. Um, with the cloud masking addition, it makes the resulting imagery simple to in interpret by anyone with uh, little to no uh, remote sensing experience. Now, here's an application of the AFAI to a large portion of the Caribbean. And we can see clearly the arrival of sargassum here uh, in the image here on the uh, lower part of the image and also towards the uh, uh, southern uh, Caribbean Sea here in the uh, just south of Puerto Rico. And, uh, and I'm also showing here the, I want to mention that I'm showing here the website, uh, the link to the website for the Sargassum watch uh, system, where you may obtain uh, regular updates uh, on the presence and, and absence of uh, Sargassum. You can subscribe to this uh, website, uh, get into their mailing list. Um, uh, you will even, even get uh, monthly reports on the presence or absence of Sargassum uh, through the Caribbean and also uh, the Gulf of Mexico and, uh, and the Atlantic. Here is the, the website for the Sargassum uh, watch system. And uh, so we encourage our participants to, uh, those who are especially interested in Sargassum or monitoring Sargassum, to connect and to explore the website. And uh, there's a lot of valuable uh, information there, uh, including papers and uh, other uh, data products. Uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to uh, go into the website and explore all the data and information that it's uh, ready available to, to anyone who's uh, interested in this. Also, we want to remind our participants that two other uh, available tools are the CDAS and uh, SNAP, also uh, software packages. Uh, we included here the links to two of our previous uh, RSET webinars. In this case, where we did, we specifically did uh, demonstrations 
of uh, how to obtain, uh, how to download the data from the from CDAS and how to process the data for chlorophyll and uh, suspended sediments and uh, and other uh, ocean color products as well. So uh, if you're interested, more more interested in in, in this uh, topic, please feel free to uh, review those uh, webinars which uh, uh, we did uh, within the last year or so. Now, another index is the, what is known as the Normalized Difference Aquatic Vegetation Index, or NDAVI. This was introduced uh, by Villa et al. in, in 2014. And uh, the NDAVI was designed to use the Landsat uh, thematic, matter, thematic Matter and Enhanced Thematic Matter Bands 1, which is the, bland, uh, the blue band centered at 480 nanometers, and uh, also band 4, the near infrared one centered at 830 uh, nanometers. And here's the, the equation for, uh, for these. And uh, and also the the paper uh, for those of you interested in, in in getting a little bit more details on the on the development the algorithm development of this uh, this uh, index. Now the idea behind using the blue band that it's, uh, which penetrates deeper into the water column and the near infrared um, was uh, to, uh, that has very little penetration in the water column. Um, and then uh, benthic aquatic vegetation can be easily distinguished from other benthic components, such as sand, mud, and others. Here's some data from another uh, recent NASA developed project uh, where they explored different indices to follow potential correlations with particular environmental factors. In this case, uh, there's a unique, uh, like I said, a unique band combination of near infrared and blue. Uh, and this allows to analyze uh, the presence or absence of seagrasses. Um, the photosynthetic uh, organisms, as I said, they reflect a large, am a large amount in the near infrared. So the near infrared band and the blue band collectively allow for the aquatic vegetation to be assessed, particularly in very shallow uh, clear waters. Now, uh, this figure uh, looks at NDAVI in the Chandelier Islands from the same project that I uh, mentioned before. Um, five points were selected across the islands. So we're, that was, that's what we're seeing here on the left-hand side. And their NDAVI distribution was compared from 1984 to about 2021. The left-hand panel here shows the true color uh, NDAVI imagery in the, in the spring uh, of, uh, of, of 1984, and also then the right hand and the, and the, and in 2021. Now, as we move through the center or the panel here, which this uh, this uh, time series uh, analysis, it's very interesting to see that the NDAVI has shifted in relation to many different uh, hurricanes and catastrophic events uh, that occur within this about 30, 36 years um, uh, time period. Here's uh, some of the some of the main hurricanes or, or storms that went by the Chandelier Islands, or even some uh, man-made uh, uh, catastrophes, such as uh, the oil spill uh, in the uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, these images here show the the NDAVI in the summer months of. Uh, um, in particular, especially in 2000 to 2020. And the highest values, values on the index are shown in green. And this occurs very, occur very close to the, uh, very, very close to the islands each year. So the images also exhibit the changes in land cover seen uh, in the previous figure. The lowland cover in the 2010 image uh, after Hurricane Katrina, uh, but before the sunburn placement is particularly uh, striking. Now, these images suggest that the decrease in NDAVI trends correspond to the, to the loss of uh, seagrasses in immediate pro proximity to the islands, 
when the when land, land area uh, disappears. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, some regions relatively far from the island have high NDAVI values. This is what we're seeing out here, especially in the in the right hand figure. And uh, so, this in this, these regions, we know that they they don't contain sea grasses, and so because sea grasses tend to occur in, in shallow areas. So, these might be artifacts related to the with the calculation of the NDAVI. But at least the index can be used as a proxy for estimating where the sea grasses were located through time in the in this case in the Chandelier Islands uh, in the southern Louisiana. Now here uh, the team compared the the index uh, uh, again acting as a proxy for for submerged aquatic vegetation health uh, for the entire Chandelier Island system uh, to a major uh, uh, lever on the environment and the Chandelier Sound the water discharge from the Mississippi River. Now, river runoff and precipitation, which contributes to river, to, uh, which uh, contributes to the to the decrease in water quality, um, uh, also have a, has a has an effect on in the water salinity as well. And uh, and historically, it seems that the submerged aquatic vegetation uh, fare better in lower salinity or uh, fresher uh, water environment, and this has major implications for the ecosystem changes that will result from the uh, installation of more river diversion uh, projects in the lower Mississippi River in the next uh, decades or so. Now, the, the apparent uh, uh, visible wavelength uh, or a, a w, a v w, uh, index it's a new algorithm that was uh, just developed a couple of years ago by uh, Ryan Baldemuling uh, and his team. And it's designed to present, represent a one-dimensional geophysical metric of color, which is, uh, um, which is in inherently correlated to the spectral shape. Now, in this case, the AVW's uh, output is in nanometers. And it analyzes the remote sensing reflectance in terms of uh, spatial and temporal trends and variability, and it is also designed to uh, to be used with both multi data sets. Now, therefore, this type of index can be applied to even upcoming ocean color satellite missions, such as a plankton aerosol cloud on ocean ecosystem or PACE mission. Which is coming up next year, and uh, even the, uh, the designated observable of uh, social surface biology and geology. And here's how it looks like: the uh, the duration of the equation, and then how it behaves. Uh, and you can see how how it models the the normalized remote sensing reflectance uh, with different wavelengths, especially within the within the uh, the red the the green region of the spectrum about 500 or so nanometers here's a paper of Muring et al for those uh, interested in the in the looking at the derivation of this particular uh, index now since the avw uses the full uh, spectral information in the visible range um, although uh, it can also use other other wavelengths such as a uh, part of the uh, ultraviolet or even the near infrared and as opposed to to, to some of those are already uh, described indices AVW becomes uh, relatively intuitive and easy to visualize when describing these these types of water see here how the the graphs on the on the right hand side corresponds to the images to the, the process images from HICO in this case, so this is hyperspectral data, and uh, and how it uh, behaves uh, as it moves throughout the images. Now uh, the QWIP or the the quality water index polynomial 
It's a, it's a quality control index developed for the uh, AVW that can be rapidly implemented into ocean color processing chains, chains uh, providing a level of uncertainty about a retrieve spectrum and flag some uh, uh, data sets that might be questionable or unusual spectra for, for further analysis. Now here, uh, HICO images were quickly screened to uh, identify pixels conforming to the in-situ based spectral behavior. And uh, our set, uh, we're not gonna go into much details about the AVW or QWIP, but our set is planning a page dedicated webinar in the near future. And we will most likely go into much more details about the uh, AVW and this uh, quality control index. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Okay, now uh, we're gonna see a demo of one of our colleagues, uh, Brittany Baudry, on how to calculate some of these indices in uh, Google Earth Engine. So take it away, Brittany. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, let's begin the Google Earth Engine demonstration here today. So this is part two, focusing on the aquatic applications. And here we will specifically be focusing on calculating NDCI, also known as the Normalized Difference Chlorophyll Index, and we will be using Sentinel-2. So we're gonna start here at the beginning of the script starting on line 12, where similar to part one, we're just creating a title for the map window. This little nice title right here, part two, calculating NDCI. So we're creating this variable title on line 13. We're just creating that title on line 14, part two. We're changing the font weight. We're selecting the font size and then just the position as the top center of our map area down below. As we move this up and down, it's always just going to stay at the very top in the center, which is nice. And then we're moving on to define our region of interest, our ROI, very similar to part one. We're just creating the variable ROI and we are selecting the geometry, which I pre-drew ahead of time. Here, it's a nice red square over our region of interest. Uh, and again, if you want to change the geometry yourself, you can always just change it from what I have here as geometry. You can change to a different geometry, the name of the asset that you might want to upload yourself. Any of that you can change right here on line 23. And then throughout the rest of the code, it should just apply to the ROI variable. And you don't have to change it all throughout your code, which is very nice and useful. Right, and then here on line 25, we are setting the ROI as our map center and setting the level of zoom to 10. So right when we hit run on the code, it's just gonna zoom right to this area instead of starting from a worldwide view, we're just zooming in right here. So let's get to the uh, fun part in part one, which is defining our study area and applying a cloud mask to Sentinel-2 data. So you might remember this section from part one when we worked with Sentinel-2. We're just creating that same cloud mask that we did last time. We're using the function mask S2 clouds. We're just selecting the QA60 band and we are selecting the clouds in Cirrus bit masks and we are setting them to zero. Again, we're just indicating clear conditions in all of the pixels that we're working with. We want nice cloud-free imagery for all of our calculations and visualizations that we're going to be working with. And so that is our function here, mask S2 clouds. And then here on 52, we are applying that cloud mask to the Sentinel-2 collection with our variable bar S2. And I'm just going to copy sort of this identification here. I'm going to paste it up here. It's the Sentinel-2. That's what we're working with today. And you can read all about it in the description. And here are the bands again. Of course, we're going to be referring back to these bands as we start talking about calculating the NDCI. And you can also always look at the image properties and anything else that you might want to learn about Sentinel-2. 
And here we are filtering by date. So the date that we're using today is September in 2021. I picked this date because there's an algal bloom over the place that we're looking at. And then we are filtering by the bound, which is our region of interest, our ROI. And then we are, again, just filtering for less cloudy pixels and then applying that cloud mask, the mask S2 clouds. And then we are taking the median values of these for our image. Which brings me to part two, in which we will calculate the NDCI over Pyramid Lake Nevada with Sentinel-2, and we're going to add it as a layer to the map. So we have this variable lake, and we're taking our Sentinel-2 imagery that we made right above, and we're just clipping it to that region of interest, that ROI in this case, our nice geometry. So we're just clipping that imagery and we're calling it lake. And then from here, we are going to calculate the normalized difference chlorophyll index. And so the formula for NDCI is the red edge one band minus red divided by the red edge one band plus the red band. So what is red edge one and what is red? What are those bands within Sentinel-2? Well, if we go and look, here we come across red in that band four, known as B4. And then here, red edge one, that is the fifth band known as B5. So we're using that same dot normalized difference function that we used in the previous uh, section that we used in part one, because it does follow that same, you know, formula of first band minus second band divided by first band plus second band. So we can continue to use dot normalized difference for this equation as well with band five and band four. So with that being said, now that it's calculated right here on line 71 with variable S2 NDCI, we're going to move on to uh, line 74, where we will set those visual parameters. Our NDCI viz right now are just the negative one to one, and the palette is white to blue, um, with blue indicating higher conditions of chlorophyll. And we are changing those min and max values later once we get them in the code, similar to part one. But for right now, the values are just negative one to one for the entire NDCI. And then we add that map to our layer, uh, here on line 77 using map.add layer. We're just adding the Sentinel-2 NDCI with those visualizations that we set, and we're naming it Sentinel-2 NDCI. And you can see that that's our layer right here. And here it is. And you can see, you know, here's Pyramid Lake, and you can kind of see the difference in vegetation, right? You can start to see some of this algal bloom where it's darker regions here, lighter regions. Of course, the area surrounding it, it's not water, so it's not too applicable to our, our region. We're really here to focus on the lake. But again, it's it's a little hard to tell. Things are very, very standard blue, a very uniform blue. And it's because we are using negative one and one in our visual parameters. So here we're going to look at what the actual minimum and maximum values are in the data set itself. And we're going to do that in line 80 by using the min max function to print those values. Instead of negative one, it's negative 0 0.329. Instead of one, the maximum value is 0 0.622. So let's go back to earlier in our code, line 74 here. We're gonna take the minimum value, and I'm just gonna copy and paste that instead of negative one, the actual minimum value here. I'm going to do the same thing for the maximum. I'm just going to take 0 0.622 and paste that, right? And so now I'm going to hit run again, and we're going to see the value here change to be a little bit more uh, visually appealing in terms of the wider change in white to blue for the min and max. So it should be a little bit easier to spot. At least I think so. Here I feel like I can see the difference in NDCI values way better. I can really see those dark areas where that 
that bloom is way better than I could before when it was negative one to one. You can really see the full change in the areas with really intense uh, chlorophyll here versus the, the lighter regions, which have less on the surface. So that's the NDCI calculation. That's the end of the script. So with that being said, we can go back to Juan to complete our presentation here. Um, thanks, Juan. Well, thanks so much, Brittany. That was super interesting. Now let's uh, summarize some of the main topics that uh, we covered today. Uh, as we saw, there's a number of simple spectral indices that have been developed uh, for uh, for aquatic applications. Most of these are for multi-spectral uh, data sets. Um, also, particular wavelengths, especially those in the near infrared and short wave infrared, they, they do not penetrate much into the water column. And these this will eventually influence the type of index that you use to do to get some uh, some idea of the presence of uh, of aquatic vegetation in your particular area of interest. Now it is important to make sure the that we do we do use an appropriate atmospheric correction algorithm uh, to the and we have applied the 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 correct one to the imagery to the pre pre processing before applying these uh, spectral indices and particularly for aquatic targets this is this is very important um, some indices are sp uh, specific to uh, particular sensors whereas others as what we just saw in the case of abw can be applied to multiple sensors and uh, new algorithms or indices may be even applicable applicable to multispectral and hyperspectral data sets Okay, so next week we will have the the final part of this uh, three part webinar series. Um, this next week we will concentrate on land based uh, spectral indices, such as uh, the enhanced vegetation index or EBI, the soil adjusted vegetation index or 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 SABI, or and also the normalized burn ratio or NBR. And, and similarly to today, we will have a short demos on uh, how to apply some of these indices in uh, Google Earth Engine. Then as a reminder, uh, there's one homework that will uh, be available on November 9th, and uh, you can access it through the uh, webinar's uh, web page, which is shown here on the slide. And the answers will be submitted. You can submit the answers via Google Forms. It's uh, very simple uh, homework. The important thing is to submit those uh, on, on be or before on November 23rd, which is the deadline for, for those. And like I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the webinar, if you attended all three sessions and completed the homework, eventually you will receive your certificate of completion. Again, here's the contact info for Amber, our team lead, myself, Brittany, and Sativa. Feel free to uh, send us an email if you have uh, any further questions or any questions that might come up after the webinar. Or uh, So feel free to you know, send us an email. Also, uh, I'd like to remind you that, to visit the RSET website where you can find not only the upcoming webinars, but also you can search on previous webinars, past webinars, and uh, have all the materials available to you uh, for your benefit. Follow us also on Twitter. There's an Arsen YouTube uh, channel as well. And uh, for those interested in other uh, capacity building programs, uh, we encourage you to visit uh, the websites of our two sister programs, Develop, uh, which is a capacity building program uh, for undergrad and grad students, and also uh, SERVE, which is, uh, deals more with our uh, international collaborations. So with that, thank you very much again for joining us today, and let's go into the Q&A. Okay, let's see the, uh, if we can share the Q&A there. Um, just want to make sure that uh, the people can hear me if uh, Brittany, if you can confirm that. Yes, I can. 
Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, again, thanks, thanks to everyone who, for for joining us today. We're gonna go into some of the uh, uh, questions that we have received over the uh, <clears throat> over this past hour. Uh, but again, if if by any chance, I mean, we we did receive quite a number of questions. I'm pretty sure that we're not gonna be covering most of most of them at least uh, now live. But we will answer them in the in the final Q and A document that. Uh, as always, our participants will have will have uh, access to it. So let's go into the first one. I think the first one is probably for you, Brittany. Uh, how can we plot a time series uh, illustrating the trend seasonality and anomalies for NDVI and a trend analysis of NDVI using Earth Engine? Yeah, definitely. Um, so. There's absolutely a way to do that within Google Earth Engine, um, at least the well, both the JavaScript and the Python version. Um, we were using the JavaScript version today, and I included a training and sort of like a guide that Google Earth Engine itself did um, on my series model. One of the tools I use is actually using NDVI. Um, and calculating seasonality and trends um, right there in the code. So I linked that training that anyone. I think we just lost you there at the end. Um, but uh, but yeah, here's a here's some uh, links to to actually to our previous Earth Engine uh, training. That we did uh, some time ago, and uh, there's a lot of information there that uh, that uh, refers to to NDVI in particular. Okay, question two is about salinity, and, uh, and we do get this question quite a uh, quite often in in our coastal or water related uh, trainings. If, if there are sensors that uh, can be used or or uh, obviously as the as the person explains in the in the in the question there's the optical sensors they do not measure salinity uh, so unfortunately there are not that many uh, that can retrieve this this parameter i included there a paper uh <clears throat> was from, from around 2010 or so from from victor clemas um on the remote sensing assistance or salinity and uh and Victor explains uh, on the, specifically on the use of uh, microwaves, uh, radiometers. Uh, these are airborne-based microwave radiometers for uh, for measuring uh, salinity. Uh, also, there was the Aquarius mission, which was a partnership between NASA and CONAE, the Argentinian Space Agency. Um, and that was in orbit for about four years or so until 2015, and the, and I did include the the, the physical oceanography uh, DAC from NASA uh, a website there, where uh, uh, people interested in this can can uh, probably retrieve some of the data that was collected during during those uh, times. I'm not sure uh, if, it, if it covered the whole globe or if it was specific for some regions, but uh, I would encourage you, our, our participants uh, to, to take a look at this. The, uh, there's one about the different, uh, explaining the differences between remote sensing reflectance, water living reflectance, probably water living radiance, maybe what the person is referring to, but uh, normalized water living reflectance. And uh, and uh, the, the, the person says that uh, he or she found the equations on how they are derived, but, uh, but they're too complicated. And if we can explain the differences. So in, in, in broad terms, uh, usually, the remote sensor reflectance is used for most of these uh, calculations. Water living radiance is used to calculate the remote sensor reflectance, and uh, under normalized water living red reflectance is a reflectance corrected for atmospheric effects. And this is usually done in the field. Uh, we usually do this in the field um, by using uh, spectral radiometers, where you collect data, spectral data from the water, and also spectral data from uh, what's called a spectral and diffuse surface panel that has a uniform surface usually around it depends on on the on the percent of white but usually what what we prefer to use is the the, the really bright ones the 90, about 98 percent uh, white and then you do the 
calculations to, to normalize the uh, for this. What I would recommend to the definitely to our participant who who, who uh, put this question into the Q and A chat is to refer to to me one of the one of the one of the best uh, references out there on on anything related to aquatic uh, uh, optics, which is the Cortis Mobley uh, Ocean Optics uh, web book, which I included the for which I included the link here in the uh, in the Q and A uh, document. Uh, Mobley goes into all the different details about uh, each of these different parameters, how they are calculated, why, and uh, the geometry that is used. So uh, yeah, all of that. So please refer to Mobley's uh, book. I I'm constantly referring to to most Mobley's uh, book whenever I whenever I, whenever I have the need. Uh, question four is about NDTI. Is it applicable on a global scale? And there was this another question that that also I think I also saw in the uh, uh, after this um, also related to NDTI and. and the applicability on global scales always for the region. So NDTI was originally developed um, by La Coderol for for small ponds, actually, um, or inland waters, uh, aquatic bodies. Um, especially with, in their case, they use uh, spot data, 10 meters uh, data, so high special resolution data. With develop with the with the the project that I mentioned during the presentation. We we applied the, the uh, similar NDTI um, to but using Landsat and Sentinel data sets uh, just to see if if we could detect uh, you know turbidity in in some of, uh, of these water bodies in the in this case in the in the western region of the U.S. Um, the applicability I will say uh, of the for global data will depend on the specific bands of the sensor. And as always, if the pixel is uh, too coarse uh, or if it's close to land masses, then it might be influenced by land features. So those uh, make sure that those pixels are not taken into account when you do the, the analysis. Uh, number five, what causes the turbidity in ponds and lakes? And I would say ponds, lakes, rivers, coastal waters, same, same uh, applicability. Uh, usually these inland water bodies or even coastal water bodies in the case of, uh, of coastal uh, areas are affected mostly by watershed related uh, issues such as uh, eutrophication and sedimentation, most likely as a result on, of land uses, uh, changes in land use and land cover. And, uh, and we've done several, several uh, RCET trainings on coastal ecosystems and uh, and uh, also on water quality, and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, details that we cover, specifically on the on parameters such as turbidity, uh, chlorophyll, and others, the, and how these are affected by uh, by different either climatic or anthropogenic conditions. Okay, number six. Uh, there, what sensors allow me? to for the to know for the temperature temperature and salinity of the water again for salinity as i said you know we, we already covered some of this in, in question two above for temp set temperatures and there's a several satellite missions that have been assessing temperature specifically if, if you're referring to sea surface temperature uh for many years uh included there the link for modis um that shows uh, particular this that lo that link uh, is for all the different products available for for Modis land based or or or, or water based uh, projects products. Similarly, uh, we included the link here for beers, and uh, also a recent paper from I think it was last year, twenty twenty two, uh, on the use of Landsat data for sea surface uh, temperature. Um, uh, that the, the participant uh, can refer to in uh, this uh, really uh, up to date uh, uh, data sets. Um, we also, I also want to mention that uh, that previously, I think it was uh, two years ago, we did an RCET training on 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 the use of uh, CDAS in particular and the transition the transition from MODIS to VIRS. Uh, uh, data now that Modis is uh, getting into the uh, is uh, probably the uh, final years, 
Uh, so also please refer to that uh, RCET webinar. Uh, and that is that one specifically to of on the use of C of CDAS on how for uh, CDAS and with MODIS and BIRS data and to calculate different parameters. I think we all, we included uh, temperature there uh, as well. I know that we covered uh, I think turbidity and chlorophyll, maybe temperature, but uh, but it's the same same methodology. Okay. Uh, yeah, is the, is the NDCI useful to predict accurate concentration? Concentration is more of a ranger than a precise estimator. So many of these indices, including NDCI, are used to get an idea of the concentrations of, of different, different parameters, uh, such as chlorophyll in, in this case. So, so not necessarily, you know, uh, really uh, spot on accurate concentration, but so just to, have, to get an idea. Yet these results can be correlated with, uh, or are usually correlated with in-situ-based uh, data or concentrations that are calculated with other more robust algorithms uh, to have a, a much better idea of the efficiency of the index to, to calculate, calculate some of these uh, parameters. Um, Number eight, how similar the band centers and bandwidth need to be between uh, different satellite sensors to be able to derive the same indices. For example, the 708 and 665 were initially proposed for NDCI. What if I wanted to derive this index with a different satellite sensor with slightly different bands? Um, this is a very good question. And the, indeed, uh, many, many of these indices are have specific band ratios. Um, Others, when you look into the literature more, for instance, uh, refer to general such as uh, green, red, blue, NIR, uh, and uh, could potentially be applied to different uh, data sets. Uh, data sets. I would always refer to the to the original paper uh, of the of the index and how it was developed. And then uh, see if it is or not applicable to uh, to other uh, satellite sensors. Number nine, and we're probably going to maybe one or two more, uh, just for the for the because of the time limitations. Number nine, if using a cell phone camera with RGB, is it possible to determine the health uh, status of submerged aquatic vegetation? The post uh, No. Uh, an RGB camera is, is very limited in the spectral capabilities. Obviously, you're just dealing with really, really broad, you know, red, green, blue uh, bands there. Um, nonetheless, I do want to mention that uh, that there is a, a citizen science based um, app out there called Hydrocolor. Um, it was developed at uh, the University of Maine, and uh, and it's free. It's really available for for Androids and for uh, for uh, iPhones, and we included the link here. Hydrocolor. What what it does is that it's it uses. So again, it's it's for citizen science. So it's not super accurate, but it's a it, uh, it will give you an idea on the not on the health of the submerged aquatic vegetation but on on some parameters like turbidity or or chlorophyll in the water um, what it will do is that you will need a what's called an an, an 18 percent um, photographer's card great card that you can buy through maybe amazon or or some other site and uh and then you take out with your phone. You take a photo at a specific angle. You uh, and the and the 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 app, the app comes with a with a compass and uh, and uh, I just uh, and also uh, another uh, <coughs> feature to let you know the specific angle where you you need to point your your cell phone at. Uh, you take a photo of the of the water, the the sky, and also of the this uh, reflectance panel or reflectance card. Uh, 18%, and then it calculates some of those uh, water quality parameters. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's pretty nice, particularly for for citizen science. Okay, uh, number ten, does the seasonal seasonality winter summer affect the detection of turbidity and chlorophyll? Of course, and, and probably most uh, aquatic based parameters. Uh, seasonality uh, will affect the presence and the, and, and the also the, the presence and the detection of of these 
So, for instance, rainy years or seasons versus drought years or seasons will show different values, of course. Um, the uh, weather, if, if you're looking at a coastal system, uh, it will be influenced by whenever there's a there is a, a, a rain event and you have, you know, a lot of uh, sedimentation getting into the water. Uh, also, also, as always, if you're using optical data, the presence of clouds will also affect the, the detection as well. Um, clouds, not only clouds, but also cloud shadows and, and, and others. Um, okay, uh, will NDCI work for waters that are not turbid? Uh, and uh, probably will stay with this one. That's the last one for now. Uh, yes, it can work. Now the, the researcher will have to be careful in terms of being sure that there's no influence of the bottom reflectance or uh, the submerged aquatic vegetation uh, in the water. If, if, you're, if you're dealing with waters that are uh, relatively clear, let's say in coastal waters, kind of like uh, coral reefs, uh, so seagrass type of waters, those are uh, usually very clear and you will have an influence of the bottom reflectance there. So most likely when you do the calculations of the NDCI, what you will be getting uh, 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 an artifact there that is created by the presence of uh, of some of these uh, benthic features uh, in in some of those sites. So something to to consider when when using NDCI specifically for waters that are not uh, that turbid. Okay, um, so we'll stay here just again for because of the limitations of time. But we will make sure that we will uh, go over this uh, Q and A document and uh, answer all of these. Uh, and and then you will have access to the to uh, specifically to the uh, to the uh, the the final document. Um, stay tuned again for next week for the part three of this uh, webinar series. And as always, uh, feel free to send us an email um, if there's anything in particular uh, about this uh, webinar that you'd like to to know. So thanks again, and stay tuned for part three. Take care.